the far right violence on the streets of Britain has become worldwide news. And it's important to remember that this violence oh, was really the result of the hijacking of the awful murder of three girls. It's, it's very much linked to the context of violence against women. We know that every three days a woman is killed here in Britain. We know that a knife, a homicide via knifing, again, that's a very large percentage of uh, those, it's 45% of, uh, 46% of homicides in, in Britain. So those that larger context is completely lost as a result of this unbridled violence uh, by the white supremacists uh, and the, the Christian far right. Um, and of course, uh, there's a reason why there's now plans by the government to consider extreme misogyny as a form of terrorism, because we do often see that women and girls are the target of this sort of really terrorism against girls and women. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, came across my mind when I watched the sort of this sheer, the hatred and the violence that we saw in the streets, um, was that how, how similar they are to the Islamists and other religious right movements. You know, they, they've got so many fundamental characteristics that they share. For example, their misogyny, their anti-Semitism, their homophobia, their use of threats and violence, their use of scapegoating, placing collective blame, demanding collective revenge, um, you know, all of these things that they do. Uh, and, you know, today it's Muslims and migrants, that's their target. In uh, Islamic uh, states, it's the apostates that are the targets, unveiled women that are the targets. Um, and they're always looking for someone to blame and to vilify and dehumanize. Um, and, you know, the similarities came, came to mind, but also how... Uh, they really use smokes and mirrors and deception and lies in order to, and, and scapegoats, in order to hide the fact that this is very much part of a larger right-wing restructuring of our societies and our world. Um, but, you know, let's blame immigrants. Let's blame the, the, the most vulnerable in our societies for all the ills. It's interesting, Mariam, that you highlight these characteristics. What we've seen unleashed uh, on the streets of Britain very quickly exposed uh, the reality of this movement. Uh, you know, it was very clearly, um, it was uh, hatred of immigrants, hatred of women, hatred of, uh, um, you know, black people, Jewish people were pretending to be supporters of Jewish people. Suddenly, you know, they were very clearly they were, you know, the, the core of anti-Semitic nature of uh, this movement uh, became apparent, despite the fact that, the, uh, you know, the supporters in the media try to pretend that there's no such thing as the right-wing movement. There's no such thing. These are just concerned citizens. But within minutes, it became very clear, uh, you know, the whole structure of this movement uh, following uh, a demonstration in Trafalgar Square of 20,000 uh, right-wing supremacists who heard Tommy Robinson's and other speakers blaming everything on the immigrants. Uh, it went back to the traditional playbook of the fascist and the right-wing. It was very clear. And I think uh, a lot of people were taken by surprise uh, initially, first few hours, uh, first day or two, uh, but people sort of suddenly remembered that this is the nature of this movement is quite uh, right wing. And I think it would be interesting to to have a look at how this is uh, emerged, how the emergence of this movement from the fringes to the mainstream uh, of the political discourse and political life of Britain and European societies in America. It would be interesting to follow this and see how this has emerged. We'll see this, you know, for always been a marginal, but very important marginal force within the uh, European and, uh, um, you know, American sort of politics. But really from 2010, we'll see a we'll see a coordinated 
effort, the presence in the media, we've seen that on the social um, media. Um, we've seen how they are, they've actually pushed against um, the traditional politics, uh, 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 parliamentary or democratic politics, uh, so to speak, uh, in, in Europe. And uh, then the emergence of them are very linked, very much linked with uh, coordinated effort to blame the immigrants. And we've seen that the immigrants, immigration issue is a really crisis for, for European mind because the history of uh, imperial and you know, uh, degrading everybody else who's not European or white, underneath that, that's been turned into a mainstream uh, uh, politics. Um, and I think that's, that's what we've seen. We've seen the last 15 to 20 years, uh, we've seen that they've, they've come, they've pushed against the uh, uh, traditional discourse. They've emerged as a, a right-wing, very, very clear agenda. We've seen that in Brexit. The, any, any standards that exist in the society, they'll attack it. Any, any um, you know, human rights is attacked. Women's rights are attacked. Um, um, and equality of uh, sexes and, and uh, it's been attacked. Uh, anything that benefits equal pay has been attacked. But all of that, this changes the, the mainstream of these ideas, the supremacist ideas, as um, coming to uh, transforming the debate into one sided, a distorted view of life that suddenly a native white sort of group of people in society are under attack. And that, I think that's these are the sort of things that we've seen emerging in the last 15 to 20 years. As you mentioned, this whole scapegoating of the vulnerable and this idea that it's actually a legitimate concern, you know, you often hear on the media, well, you know, these, these uh, white men uh, who apparently represent the white working class as if the working class is white, aren't immigrants and refugees also working class? Uh, there's a class component. It's it's not based on race. Uh, completely forgotten in all of this. And the fact that, you know, oftentimes we hear, well, isn't it a re legitimate concern? I mean, it's like asking the Nazis uh, during the Nazi time saying, well, isn't it a legitimate concern that they have about the Jews? It's it's legitimate, isn't it? That this is exactly the sort of uh, conversation that they're having about uh, about refugees and Muslims and migrants, and the fact it, it's legitimate in the sense that it has been legitimized, it has been normalized, because it is now part of mainstream discussion. When Suella Braverman talks about an invasion, when you know Nigel Farage stands behind a, 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 in front of a poster that says, you know, Britain is just breaking uh, because of all these people coming in, that legitimized conversation doesn't necessarily make it true. It's definitely not true. Uh, you know, it's, it reminds me of the Iranian regime saying that rivers are running dry in Iran because of unveiled women, or there's earthquakes in Iran because of unveiled women. No, uh, the, the rivers running dry is because of the Islamic regime's poor environmental policies, you know. Uh, in, in the same way that migrants and asylum seekers, the most vulnerable of vulnerable, are not responsible for the fact that the NHS is at breaking point. There's no housing. There's no um, uh, limited schooling. Uh, the fact that, you know, we're, we're in a period of austerity. People are, you know, poverty stricken. Uh, the number of people who have to rely on food banks. The, and during all this time, the rich have become richer during the pandemic, the rich have become richer. During this austerity, they've become richer. The poor have become poorer. And who are we going to blame? Not those who are responsible, Tory party, po for, for example, Tory party policies, but let's blame those who have nothing, the immigrants and the, you know, the, the asylum seekers who've just come off of boats, apparently. Uh, as Chomsky says, you know, consumerism and hate are great ways in getting, uh, let me just go on the, the exact quote here. He says, um, diver diversion to consumerism or hatred of the vulnerable is so powerful so that the ruling class can do exactly as they please. And that's exactly what, what the issue is. So there is no legitimacy um, 
to burn down asylum seekers as there was no legitimacy to gas Jews during Nazi Germany. You know, and I think that's important to recognize. The other thing is this idea of replacement, you know, this concern that we're being replaced by people who are incompatible with Western civilization and with our societies. That's not true. They're human beings. And, uh, you know, they're human beings. And it, what, what, it, what it doesn't look at is how Britain's racist imperial past, for example, has created these routes for migration um, in which, of course, you know, cheap labor was brought in order to rebuild this country after, after the war and how that's created these sort of links that continue. The refugee crisis, I mean, the majority of refugees, just as, as uh, a fact, are living in the third world. They're not in, in, in the West, but as a human rights issue, what are the responsibilities of Western governments, of Britain, for example, towards people, particularly when you look at how their intervention has created uh, much of the refugee crisis? So I think we can go through a lot of this, these bogus arguments. Um, and, you know, I, I think for one, for sure, you, know, you should be glad there are immigrants coming to this country, migrants coming to this country. For one, it helps you know, the food situation. You've got a better cuisine in this country as a result of uh, immigrants and refugees. In fact, what's the number one dish in uh, in Britain? It's chicken, chicken tikka masala. Thank you very much to the Indians who've come here. You know, at least be grateful you're not eating that same, what what is it, really badly boiled cabbage <laughs> or, you know, sausage and mash every day. <laughs> Uh, very interesting. You, uh, you highlight the, you highlight the cultural, uh, rich cultural um, aspect of immigration. But I think, as you pointed out, um, you know, the the crisis of immigration is a constructed crisis. It's been created uh, to undermine uh, the um, cohesion of society. It's been created because people have been made illegal. They were not illegal before. They could come and seek asylum, uh, start working immediately and contribute to society. As many of us who sought ref uh, asylum and sought refugee in the 70s and 80s were the clear routes and there were not crisis of uh, immigration. There were no issues. People have started working, contributing and, um, and, and benefit to society and there were no issues. It was only became an issue when the ruling class decided this is a business is a great business to have. Uh, the more illegal person people you have in a country, they may make them illegal because it depresses the wages. The politics of economics of refugee and migration is to depress the wages by making people illegal. The more illegal people there are, the more uh, undocumented people uh, there are, it, it would benefit the um, uh, people who employ uh, undocumented people because they don't pay them decent wages. But if everybody is legal, they've got all the benefits like everybody else, they come and contribute to pay taxes, then there is no issue of... So this is part of a divide and rule and fragmentation of, of society. You'll see that narrative of broken Britain all the time, you know, uh, fragmented society, uh, you know, the crisis that exists, a narrative constantly being injected to create that bogus sort of scenario. And who benefits from that uh, are the ones who uh, are ready-made. And the uh, imperial psyche of British ruling class, uh, I think, is, is at play here. You've created a pool of people who they think the greatest, uh, you know, they're not, they're not, they're superior to everybody else. And that sort of superiority is a ready-made pool to attract people into, to create, to this division, creating of division uh, within society. So that's a, a constructed, a, a created crisis, uh, as far as um, I can see, uh, people who, uh, uh, working class contribute, working class build things, working class uh, uh, create wealth. Uh, and then the more people you have, the more richer society uh, would be in every country. The fact that there's not enough NHS uh, uh, resources, it's because the ruling class lied. They said £350 million pound a week, I think, or a month as part of Brexit. Do you remember that? Where is that? You know, complete lies. 
Uh, so that money exists. They calculated it. Actually, that money exists. Where is that money? So you see, that that's the problem with the issue. The housing, privatizing all the housing stock that exists, and stopping local authorities building uh, housing for uh, for decades now, is you know to the benefit of the people who have property and rental uh, market. Uh, that created a situation, uh, blaming immigrants who actually contribute, blaming labor or working class who contribute and create wealth, and dividing the uh, uh, working class into immigrants, non-immigrants, white, you know, Pakistani, Indian, English, Scottish, Irish working class, by creating that uh, division effectively as part of a you know traditional you know divide and rule uh, policy, and you can see that in in play today. And I think that's that's these are the nature of the um, uh, the uh, rise of the right wing uh, that uh, we are seeing on the streets of Britain. But as you said, they don't have any legitimacy. There is no legitimacy for burning people, beating people up based on race, and uh, you know actually breaking the windows and entering into people's home. Uh, people who have no, uh, you know, you know, then they're not part of a dispute. Uh, just because uh, um, they are uh, they are of different race or uh, or color, uh, mm -hmm. and I think anybody who tries to legitimize uh, uh, the right wing uh, movement and deny the existence and that's the other thing you could see people like Doug, Douglas Mason. Oh, there's there's no British National sort of party. There's no BNP. There's no uh, Union of Fascists in Britain. But deny there exists such a things. So who organised twenty thousand people going to demonstration in Trafalgar Square? Uh, a few days before the riots, who actually psyched up everybody in, in preparation for riots. Uh, who has been uh, drumming this uh, uh, idea for day in, day out, for years and years? Look at, you know, and, and these are the things that we, uh, the, the, they're trying to deny the existence of the movement. Okay, the characteristics of the movement is organization is very, uh, uh, very spread uh, all over. But organizing it through the social media, which we'll come to, to discuss later on organizing that's a new way of organizing of the right wing and i think we need to understand uh, uh, the characteristics of this movement and here how it operates but it does exist a right wing and is in the mainstream they have members of parliament uh, you have Nigel Farage, you have, you know, three or four members of parliament and the other uh, uh, members of parliament who have for years been supporting them from Boris Johnson to Sula Braverman and, and uh, very, uh, successive uh, home secretaries, Tory home, home secretaries and, uh, and Tory party and the media. Uh, and that's what we've been doing for years and years. Yes, exists. The right wing group exists. It's in the mainstream of politics in Britain, but they need to be. Uh, confronted with the argument and the narrative to be able to uh, respond to them. Interestingly, the emergence of the uh, right wing coincided with the uh, rise of the social media and how social media platforms um, had been effectively manipulated by the rich and the powerful. Uh, and it's um, you could, in the early days social media and the internet was seen as liberating, if you remember, that everybody could uh, share information with no inhibition and no limits. What we have seen, and particularly during the Brexit period and a Brexit vote in England, uh, remember uh, the Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica scandal, where Facebook were using personal data and sold it to uh, people who could buy, uh, in this case, a right-wing both in the United States and in England, uh, to uh, manipulate the data um, um, and and try to uh, generate a, a reality in favour of the Brexit vote and in America in favour of Trump and the right wing. We've always had media trying to create consent. We've had, uh, you know, traditionally right wing media like Daily Mail, Telegraph and various Murdoch sort of empire uh, trying to continuously uh, pompage distorted views and stories uh, into society. But recently, particularly in the last uh, uh, 10 years, social media has been the core of organising of the uh, uh, right wing. That's why how they've, they've organised themselves, how they've projected onto the society, how they've created alternative reality, uh, you can see that in the United States, you'll see, you'll see that in Britain, 
and the nature of that it's been very apparent and glaring in the um in the recent riots in britain the riot being organized through social media uh, various groups created uh, constantly uh, uh, telling lies about the incidents uh, projecting distorted uh, uh, news and fake news uh, of what's happened into narrative of the right wing and replacement theory and the, you know the native white the non-existent native white to under under attack uh, and creating uh, that sort of vision and narrative and we could see that in the uh, with the rise of people like um, Elon, Ma Elon Musk of uh, Twitter, is abandoned uh, any standard that existed, any safety stand uh, standard. Thousands of people who used to work for under pressure of uh, protests uh, regarding the distorted news and manipulation, uh, Facebook created safety rules. Uh, Twitter had to employ a lot of people to uh, counter. Uh, lies that exist on um, um, on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Uh, with the recent years, they've all of those been removed. Uh, Twitter now is cesspit of uh, right wing propaganda. Uh, you, may, you know, you'll have all the bots operating there. Uh, all the right wing you know, people like Tommy Robinson and uh, right wing media constantly promoted. Enhance it's impossible you open your YouTube, you don't see the face of Nigel Farage or Tommy Robinson and people arguing in favor of the right wing. You could see the whole architecture and the structure of the social media, major tech giants been uh, designed in such a way to promote the right wing. And this, this is an issue. Uh, and that's how the right wing uh, organizes it, itself. Now, the question then it emerges into freedom of expression. If you want to highlight the issue of abuse that goes on, goes on, inciting of riots and hatred that goes on on these social media, the immediately you come uh, confronted with you. Oh, right, there's a freedom of speech. Everybody can uh, and say what they want. But that's not true. Not everybody can say what they want because a lot of progressive views have been banned, distorted, and actually non they, they can't reach anybody. As you say, Fibro, social media is being used by the far right as a way of organizing, of inciting violence, inciting hate, which has real effects then on the streets with, you know, their attempts to burn people alive uh, in asylum seekers and attacking anyone who's uh, minoritized or considered the other. Um, but it also social media is a platform for anti-racist and anti-fascist to organize. And I think we also have to use that tool, even if it is, um, you know, has a propensity to promote far right and right wing views, it, to use it as a platform in order to organize against the fascists and against the racists. And and we've seen that happen as well. The The sort of far right violence that we saw on the streets was quickly snuffed out really by the vast mobilizing efforts um, both on social media and on the streets of anti-fascist and anti-racist and soon we saw very clearly that actually they're a minority they don't represent a vast majority of people in this country and it is the anti-racist and anti-fascist point of view that is very much mainstream even though you won't get that sense by looking at social media I think some of the things we, we can do is, one, make a stand, as we saw in the protests. Quickly, we saw how the, the, the sort of far right disappeared from the streets, in a sense, because of this sort of standing uh, our ground and defending asylum centers, citizen, advi citizen advice bureaus, uh, defending uh, minority communities, uh, Muslims, immigrants, refugees against uh, their attacks. And I think another important aspect of the work that we need to do is debunking all of these myths. I mean, when you look at the issue, for example, of migration, migration is a fact of life, you know, in our world today. And um, as things get worse, uh, more and more people are going to migrate out of no choice of their own. And it's interesting how, you know, when when the poor and working class are migrating, really when you see this attack on refugees and, and immigrants, it is an attack on the poor and working class. No one ever mentions the migrants, they're not even called migrants, coming on private jets and buying up Harrods and 
parking their Ferraris outside of, uh, you know, um, Mayfair. Um, no, one, no one calls them migrants uh, buying up apartments uh, in London, for example. Uh, no one calls Starbucks a foreign company, a migrant company who doesn't pay taxes. You know, this language, this criminalization, uh, the language of criminalization, the language of illegality is targeted towards, you know, really towards the working class and, and the poor who are forced to flee um, in undocumented ways very often, which, as you mentioned earlier in the program as well, it, it has always been part and parcel of the right to asylum. People fleeing persecution cannot necessarily always get visas or proper documents and they're forced to flee and they have a right to flee both under British law as well as international law. And the other interesting component about this issue of migration when we're debunking myths is one in ten British person is a migrant. They live outside of Britain. One in ten. Uh, but, you know, they're called expats. They're not called uh, migrants, uh, um, you know, or, or refugees. They, they, and they choose to live. They, they, they believe they have a right to live wherever they want. I, I agree. I mean, I believe in freedom of movement for everyone. But it's interesting that when it comes to primarily the poor and working class, then these rights no longer exist. So I think debunking the myths, standing our ground is hugely important. And as a response also to the far right, I think a defense of our common humanity, it's not about, uh, you're not superior if you're white, uh, if you're a citizen, you know, we're all human beings. And this idea of a little piece of paper, your documentation does not make you a lesser person and does not make you illegal and doesn't make you someone that can be vilified and dehumanized and set on fire uh, as a result. So this demand for uh, um, uh, respecting and understanding our common humanity, that we have more in common than not, and breaking these divide and rule concepts that have really become so normalized in order to allow for the legitimization and justification of the dehumanization of so many people just because they don't have a specific passport or because they're of a different race. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you're right, Mariam. This is the completely anti-working class uh, um, attempt by the right wing to uh, um, come up with the narrative, uh, distorted narrative, narrative of reality. Um, as you said, immigration is going to be one feature of the uh, future. And I think it's important that the right narrative uh, is established. Uh, we need to be able to create solidarity uh, between people. Now, it's very interesting that what happened in Britain immediately after uh, uh, right-wing riots started, within a day or two, uh, started in Bristol, people started to get together, and that spread very quickly. Uh, uh, and the uh, protest against the right-wing was based on solidarity. And, and common humanity, as you mentioned. And that's one of the lessons of the uh, anti-far-right, uh, anti-fascist movement that has been in the past and is resurrected now. And I think it's very important to learn the lessons of what happened in the last um, uh, couple of weeks in, in Britain. Uh, if it wasn't for the... If it wasn't for the protesters uh, against the uh, right being on the streets of Britain, police would not be able to stop it. Police cannot stop the right wing on its own. It was only when this uh, protest started uh, across Britain and masses of pe people came out uh, to oppose them and show that the uh, you know uh, the core of the British society is based on solidarity. Um, it was only then that the tide was turned, and I was very quickly the the um, the environment changed. Uh, now the right wing has to run around trying to justify their own existence. And that, that's um, uh, that's one of the lessons, and I think that the has the uh, the protests in England has quite a few lessons that need to be learned. As you said, combating the narrative and the lies, we need to deal with the uh, with the uh, social media that exists. You know, these giant platforms with huge and you know seemingly unlimited funds, who constantly promoting, they need to be reined in. I mean, that's you know, while we protect freedom of expression, 
why be protect and nobody should be uh, um, arrested jailed for uh, saying what they have they want to say and I think that's precious freedom of expression but at the same time billionaires you know, a handful of billionaires who constantly distort in realities and lies with un seemingly un, you know, limited wealth, they cannot be allowed to distort a reality and use the resources. And I think that's something that it's, it's going to be uh, the feature of the discussion in terms of combating uh, the uh, rise of the right wing. The other thing is that we can't just limit ourselves to the uh, streets. Although the streets are ours, and I think that's one of the slogans on a protest was that the, these are our streets, they're not yours. And I think that, that's really important. We have to deal not only with the right wing narrative, but also we need to deal with the mainstream politics, mainstream politicians, mainstream media who've been constantly for years and years been pumping out anti-immigrants and the right wing politics. Remember Daily Mail, you know, day in, day out, the... Uh, um, uh, ostracized immigration and immigrants and that's the result of the riots of the right-wing riots the result of those years of uh, uh, media publicity and they need to be held account for that um, uh, the other th the other element is that we, people need to organize historically there have been trade unions who uh, uh, had to take this issue trade unions must recognize the uh, the right-wing politics and anti-immigration politics is a class issue. If they want to defend the working class, they need to defend all of the working class. There is no such thing, and I want to repeat, there is no such thing as white native grievance is legitimate. There is no such thing. These are right-wing politics. These are the very ones who in 1930s in Germany and the rest of Europe, they were arguing exactly the same uh, narrative against the Jews, the, you know, the, the Romans and the socialists. That's what they did. Exactly the same thing really based on that playbook. They are rehearsing those uh, arguments and, and politics and they need to be challenged. So clear narrative in combating that, recognizing immigration, a fact of life going forward in, into the future. And we need to create safe routes for people to uh, um, uh, uh, people to be able to seek uh, refuge, both from an environmental disease, disaster that exists and wars being created and gener uh, generated by militarism and the right wing, very right wing governments and, and, and politics who's generating displacing of people and destruction of the homes. Yes. At these points, usually the right wing try to consolidate, they organize right wing try to consolidate themselves. Whether they're Islamists, they're trying to use the opportunity to uh, uh, strengthen the position within the government um, and the relationship with the state. You'll have the right wing media and the right wing groups, uh, uh, supremacist right, right wing groups try to use the opportunity that exists and try to consolidate the, uh, the gain and we need to uh, oppose all the right wings that they uh, that they are and be very clear in terms of our narrative and defending refugees as a basic human right and the fact of life that's, that we need to uh, have going forward into the future.